This is Bronwyn Jakes with Kelvin Neufeld on August 30th, 2017 at Stauffer Library on Queen's University campus for the In Our Own Words, the links between Kingston's heritage and its penitentiary's oral history project. Kelvin, could you tell me a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. Um, yeah, my name's Kelvin Neufeld. Um, I am 35 years old. I live in Perth, Ontario, but I did uh, live in Kingston previously. Um, particularly, I spent one year in an apartment right next to Frontenac Institution. Um, so that was the view on my horizon for, for a year. And I have just a few stories related to that. But um, in addition to that, personally, what I do, I'm a social justice advocate and educator. I am a trans man. I was born female and I transitioned at around the age of 25. Um, and I do education around sexual and gender diversity um, and I also am involved separately in the Evolve Our Prison Farms campaign uh, which is a community coalition um, united by concerns around animal agriculture in, in the prison system um, as part of the rehabilitative programming so now that the government is considering bringing back prison farms uh, we are proposing that they be plant-based agriculture, innovative, environmentally sustainable plant-based agriculture. Uh, and if they want to bring animals in as part of the rehabilitative programming, we uh, believe that sanctuary is uh, the best model to involve animals in rehabilitative programming with prisoners, as opposed to dairy operations or other forms of animal agriculture. So that is what I'm currently involved in, and uh, so as part of that work, I've met um, a great number of people connected to prisons and the prison system, uh, and every perspective. Um, as part of my research personally, I've tried to dig up every possible perspective on prisons um, and, and the farms, but particularly my, my educational process in terms of the prisons has been um, really eye-opening. So did the pro your proximity to Frontenac Institution affect how you saw the city or how you interacted with other people within the city? It made me more aware of just how many people are connected to prisons. I mean, Kingston is an exceptional example because it's the, the penitentiary capital of Canada. And there's no other city that has that number of prison facilities anywhere in Canada. So it really did open my eyes that when there's a community with, that has prisons in it and around it, the number of people who have been to prison who are now in the community, the number of people who work in the prisons, the number of people whose family members have been incarcerated, a lot of families will move to the city where somebody's incarcerated. So it really just, it's enmeshed in the community. And it gave me a sense, you know, it made me think that when, when the prison farms were being closed, one of the statements that kind of caught my attention following the whole story of what was happening, one of the things that caught my attention was when the former Minister of Public Safety, Peter Van Loan, was justifying the decision to close the farms. I think it was Peter Van Loan. Uh, he said, you know, that they're going to reallocate the money. Why spend the money on this? The first thing that, that the conservative government cared about was public safety. After public safety is assured, then we can pay attention to rehabilitation. And I thought, this is absolutely mind-boggling. How can you divorce public safety from rehabilitation? They're one and the same. And the idea that rehabilitation would be put second <laughs> uh, when you're somebody who has lived and who has family and friends who live, when you're someone who lives in the community around a prison, rehabilitation is everything. And his decision to close the farm, saying it doesn't make the community safer, and yet the community is saying the farms make our community safer. I don't think it's right for the government to step in and tell the community what it is that's going to make the community safer. The community that lives with prisons should have a say in what it takes to make a community safe and not have that decision come in from the outside. Uh, this is our community. Have you ever, when you were living in Kingston, or since, have you ever interacted with prisoners or formerly incarcerated people? 
in my work now, I'm currently trying to uh, reach out to the prison population because the government has challenged us to report on what the prisoners want in terms of a prison farm. Would they prefer animal agriculture or would they prefer sanctuary? We feel pretty sure what, what the prisoners would prefer, what kind of involvement with animals would be most enjoyable and least conflicted for prisoners. Uh, but the government does want us to talk to prisoners. So we currently have contact with a prison warden here and uh, we're going to be approaching the prison inmate committee and survey surveying them and talking to the prisoners themselves. And we hope we'll also have an opportunity to survey the, the whole prison population or at least a considerable portion of the prison population as part of the government's process to, to determine what, where the interests lie and uh, where the benefits lie. So that is coming soon, but it's very hard. We've tried. I've been involved in Evolve Our Prison Fires for over a year now, but the doors to prisons are closed so tightly and they don't have internet. So you can't say, here's a link to a survey or here's our email. Uh, we have to write a letter to who? And then trying to track down former prisoners who could report on their experiences when they worked on the farms. How do you do that? How do you track down it? And if you do, how do you come to somebody and say, oh, hey, I know you were in prison. Will you talk to me? <laughs> right, so it, there, it's such a secret, shut world that for anybody for them, from the outside, it's very hard to get in. Uh, even to just talk to someone and have them feel safe talking to you. Well, why are you wanting to know about why I was in prison or what my experiences were there? But now, through a government contact, we do have that, that open door. So it hasn't happened yet, but we, we will be going in within the next month or two to talk, actually, finally, talk to prisoners and hear the prisoners' voices. So maybe we can move into um, learning more about Evolve Our Prison Farms and your involvement with that. Evolve Our Prison Farms, it started when the government announced that it was considering reopening the farms. Because I, the history being that the prison farms were shut down uh, between 2009 and 2011 by the former Harper Conservative government, claiming they cost too much money and they're not any good as rehabilitation. Now, a lot of critics suggest that it was really um, more of a move to appear tough on crime. Uh, the money saved was minute and the numbers, they never really revealed how they calculated the numbers. They said, oh, the whole prison farm system in Canada costs taxpayers four million a year, which is nothing uh, in terms of their budget. And uh, how they got those numbers is not very clear and the farms in Kingston made money. Um, they were the only ones, uh, particularly Frontenac Institution, uh, reportedly made about two, two million a year in revenue. So um, how they made their calculations is, is questionable. So that happened and then of course Save Our Prison Farms cropped up in Kingston to say, no, don't close the farms, keep them, keep them. They're valuable. And they worked very hard and they poured their, their hearts and their sweat and blood and tears into it and it culminated in a blockade and several members went to prison as a result of that blockade, that peaceful blockade, and the farms were shut down. And uh, so now that this government, is the Trudeau government, is considering reopening them, we heard the news and I was just talking to my mother about it one day. She said, well, you know, if they're going to bring those cows back, wouldn't it be nice if those cows could come back to sanctuary? And that's where it started. That, what? Uh, why has this never even been thought of before? Of course, absolutely. And it became more. It became about so much more than just the farms. All of a sudden, we're thinking about what does constitute the best form of rehabilitation. So not just thinking in traditional farming techniques and practices, and 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 you know, with the old farms, the conservative government said that you know. It doesn't really teach employable skills. There just aren't a lot of jobs in the agriculture sector and the dairy sector is increasingly automated. They're not training people in milking cows is not where the jobs are. So this suddenly clicked on so many levels. We can introduce innovative farming techniques and, and green, uh, green agriculture, sustainable agriculture. We know that animal agriculture is potentially the number one contributor to climate change. It's potentially the one most 
the single most devastating um, uh, contributor to all of the land degradation and rainforest clearing and the uh, methane emissions and greenhouse gases and at high water use, you know, high input, energy input. So with all of the climate change issues and the concerns around the environment and suddenly opening our thinking about what would constitute the best rehabilitative programming, it just clicks, it just makes sense. and. Um, so over the past year or so, uh, we have been, um, you know, we have a petition going, a Save the Herd petition, which has to date about 4,500 signatures, uh, hundreds in Kingston, thousands in Canada and internationally. So there's a lot of interest and a lot of people paying attention to Kingston right now. Because this is where it begins. The government wants to begin with Kingston's prison farms. And Kingston is a city that, you know, prides itself on innovation. It's Kingston, where history and innovation thrive. It's this perfect, this is absolute perfect. And I think even if you were to talk to people in the community, would you rather that when prisoners come out of the prisons that they worked in animal agriculture when they were incarcerated or that they worked in a sanctuary when they were... In the quality of person coming out of that prison you know, which one would make you feel more trusting? Um, you know, and, and uh, Corrections Canada uh, and CORCAN, they, they've identified that decreasing stigma towards prisoners is one of their priorities. And I feel that something like sanctuary would go a long way to decrease stigma. And the, just the image itself, rather than an image of prisoners milking cows and in fact slaughtering cows, they are actually trained in the slaughterhouse mm -hmm. on site at the prison. Um, to me, that could actually add to the stigma, prisoners slaughtering cows. But to picture prisoners working with cows in under sanctuary, non-exploitative care of animals, human-animal bonding and therapy without the conflicts that are inherent in, in dairy and, and other forms of animal agriculture, that it would go a long way to, de to decreasing stigma. And, you know, we do, we have heard from prisoners who had worked on the farms and, you know, how gut-wrenching it was to them when a calf would die or you know when the cows would wail when the calves are separated from the cows or uh, when the cows would be shipped off uh, to, to slaughter you know it tore them up it tore them up it tore them apart and yet the bonding that they received with those cows you know the one inmate former inmate in particular Pat Kincaid who, who rather famously talks about his experiences on the prison farms He's, he credits the cows as having saved him, uh, changed the direction, the trajectory of his life. His life was a trajectory of recidivism. He would always go back and reoffend, and uh, now he's he considers himself su successfully rehabilitated, and he credits that directly to his experiences with the cows. So we know that there's you know great potential and and community building potential too. I, I believe that the Kingston community would love this story, the idea of, of sanctuary and healthful foods too, local food production, use our farmland, grow the best, the healthiest food. I, 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 I strongly think that, that Corcan, um, they, sh they, they aren't there to dictate to prisoners what they must eat, but the food produced on prison farms using prison labor as part of their programming, it should be the healthiest food. And that teaches healthy diets, healthy lifestyles. It teaches being in a direct relationship with what you put in your body and how you take care of yourself. And physical health and mental health are directly connected. And so it just, it really clicks. It really makes sense. And, and it's um, an, an inspirational story, you know, to think of doing something new like this. And it's not entirely new, some other prisons do have some form of sanctuary programming and obviously agriculture, but um, this would just be such an inspiring feel-good story and it has already begun to attract attention um, elsewhere in the world and in, in Canada. So this has a, really has the potential to, to put Kingston on, on the world stage and model for the rest of Canada and the rest of the world what what we can really accomplish in terms of rehabilitation and, and even food production and sustainable agriculture mm -hmm. so um, it's exciting and it has you know opened doors for us to to talk to the government and to meet with the correctional services staff and uh,
know, what, we, we could do anything here. This is a tremendous opportunity. The doors are wide open. And so we feel that just going back to the old model on every level would, would, would just be a bit of a loss. Um, so let's, let's think about current market realities and, and trends. And the trends right now are towards sustainability. Mm -hmm. And then that educate, it would educate prisoners too about environmental issues and, and ethical issues as well. And really put um, uh, sort of a bottom line of reverence for life that underscores mm -hmm. all of it. Take care of your body, take care of each other, the animals that, that you work with, and, um, and that no violence is justifiable, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're really hoping that we are at a moment in history here. Uh, and the government, uh, so far, uh, it appears uh, they appear to be listening. So, That's right amazing. now we're on the, the cusp of, of potentially big change. That's amazing. Um, have you, would you say that overall the support in Kingston and the wider community has been overall positive, or have you faced any opposition? Everybody we talk to, Everybody we talk to, the idea clicks right away. That makes sense. I think everybody we talk to has never thought of it before either, but right away the idea clicks and we just find it's, it's just, it's like, it's, I can't say viral because we haven't gone viral in that big sense, but the idea is viral and it just spreads by itself. It's like catches like wildfire. Um, and then that opens questions to, wait a minute, yeah, that other mod, the, the way it was is not, it, it, it opens eyes to how, the alternative actually doesn't make sense, which again, people tend not to have thought about, including myself before all of this. I never thought about the cows that I saw in the fields, why they were there, what happened to them, why they're always the same age, right? Because it's a manipulation of the cow population and um, right? well, there's all kinds of problems um, connected to that. So there has been some concern from the Save Our Prison Farms people who have been working for so long to bring the farms back and we are very sensitive to that and very aware of that and before we submitted anything to the government we made sure to meet with a lot of them individually to share our idea and to make sure that they wouldn't feel that this is something we're not in opposition to them we feel that this actually is a way of accomplishing their goals as well bring the farms back bring the cows home and you know, so there have been many Save Our Prison Farm supporters who actually say, you know what, that that led me to a serious rethink. I hadn't thought about that. And absolutely, I, I even support this even more than just dairy. I wasn't really even about the dairy particularly, but the farms and what the, the prisoners, the experiences of the prisoners gain, gain working on the farms. And, and then others are a bit concerned that at this stage in the process, this is asking too much and they're afraid it could create the uh, um, impression of, of a divided uh, a community around this. And so we all throughout we're being very careful to not, this isn't about division. This is about shared goals, different possible models for the government to consider. And we personally feel that this is the best model um, for, for them to consider, but it's not our decision. We just want to put it on the table and have that dialogue um, without worrying about, we don't want to have to worry about who it offends and in what ways. This is a, a good solid idea and we have to have these conversations because this is about prisoner rehabilitation. This isn't about um, criticizing dairy farmers. It's not about that. This is about prisoner rehabilitation so we have to keep it in that context and remember that that's what we are talking about. Which is a, you know, about creating also a, a sustainable and compassionate society. You know, how do we build that? How do we nurture that? Uh, so for the most part, Absolutely, 100%. It just clicks for people. And uh, you, you'd ask how many supporters. In Kingston, we've got hundreds of people who support, right? And soon we're going to be actually launching a public campaign, a Facebook page and, and, uh, and uh, you know, pamphlets and everything like that to really harness that, that public support and, and channel it into something supportive and constructive, not divisive. And, uh, and of course, internationally too, we have a great number of people uh, interested. And we've got filmmakers in Montreal and Toronto who have expressed interest in doing some form of documentary or other kind of collaboration on this because it's the idea and it's the story that's unfolding is fascinating. And it just, 
comes down to that really good idea. Mm-hmm. Well, it's an excellent idea. Yeah. When you told me about it over email, I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. Wow, that makes perfect sense. That's, that's exactly <laughs> the response we receive yeah. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So we're very hopeful, not because of we're doing this campaign right or anything like that, but the, it's just the idea. Mm-hmm. It stands on its own. It's not about us or, or anything. So do you know if... Um, because Collins Bay are front line institution, because that prison farm closed relatively recently. I'm thinking like Joyce Hill or Pittsburgh, where the farms closed quite a while ago. Do you know, do you think that the government would consider reopening those farms as well? They're talking about the Frontenac farm and the Joyce Hill farm right now for a combined acreage of something like 1,500 acres, and that's a lot of land to put back into use. And you know, I'll be honest, they are saying, "What do you suggest? <laughs> what do we do with 1,500 acres?" I say anything you want, you know. There's every possible combination of things you could do with with that amount of land. Now, when they had large dairy herds, most of that land was just growing food for the cows. Uh, And that's just also inefficient. It's inefficient use of land and and food. So uh, with a smaller number of cows, because right now the pen herd, the famous... Kingston pen herd right now is at about 30, 32 cows, mostly second or third generation because they're still in dairy production. A cow will live 20 plus years, naturally, mm-hmm. but in dairy they tend to be slaughtered between four and six years of age So we and, and continually impregnated, of course. So this is second, third generation that would be returned, you know, but we feel that this is symbolic too. So it's, it's that whole history of that herd and the heritage of it because people in the community feel very connected to the pen herd is symbolic of the farm program, symbolic of the prisons, symbolic of the benefits that the prisoners received from working with the cows. So we feel that this is an opportunity to make it even more symbolic than it even has been in the past. That herd, bring them home to sanctuary. And I see almost symbolically, you've got the cows being freed. So they meet at that that cross-section of freedom and incarceration. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm sure that that would not be lost on the prisoners themselves. And there's something very beautiful about that. And the farms are used as the transition that prisoners have from the prison system into the community. So I think that that's the perfect, perfect possible transition that we can be offering prisoners. And of course, the cows. That's beautiful. Um, kind of lost the question I was going to ask after you said that. Um, do you, where are the cows now, the, the third or fourth generation? Where, where are they? They're divided up between a number of farmers who were part of the Save Our Prison Farms movement. So Save Our Prison Farms, when the farms were being shut down and there's nothing else that they could do, they formed a co-op, the Penherd Co-op. So it's a cooperative of people who raised money to buy as many of the auctioned cows. So the cows were just shipped off to auction. Uh, and uh, so they raised something, it was somewhere between $30,000 and $50,000. And uh, so it was a num- maybe five or six or seven farmers divided up the cows, added them to their dairy dairy um, operations, and have been caring for them, you know, caring for them uh, since, in anticipation of the farm's return, because they thought the Harper government would get elected out in the next election. So they really thought they were taking these cows on for a very time-limited period. And then Harper got re-elected, and they realized there's no chance of the farms being reopened for another several years. And so I think the farmers are very tired. They are very eager to see those cows return. Um, and so, you know, kudos to them, because they did save those cows. And they saved all that heritage and all that history. Mm-hmm. And um, and we just see this as the perfect ending to the story. So, in terms of logistics of reopening the farm, um, I don't I, I don't personally know this answer. Are the buildings like the farm buildings behind Collins Bay at Frontenac Institution are they still intact, or have they been completely stripped and auctioned? You know, everything auctioned off. Most of it, my understanding is that most of it has been dismantled and auctioned off. So that's one of the biggest barriers that the government themselves have identified when they did their feasibility study about bringing back the prison farms. Their consultants identified a number of barriers to to reestablishing dairy. Because you'd have to, dairy involves 
uh, a lot of equipment, processing equipment and milking equipment, and a, um, a sizable herd with you know a number of milking stalls and all these things. Most of the animal stalls had been dismantled, not all, as I understand it, and all the dairy processing equipment has been sold off. So it would be an investment of a, of a few million dollars just for the dairy side alone. And yet, if you brought back 30 cows or so, you wouldn't need the infrastructure for the animals, you wouldn't need the milking equipment, you wouldn't need to be using the prime agricultural farmland just to feed a large herd. You can do so much more, produce so much more food and volume with a fraction of the infrastructure, a fraction of the operational costs, and training in methods of agriculture and green technologies that will actually increase the likelihood of prisoners getting employment upon release because they're being trained and taught things that traditional farmers don't have access to right now. So rather than training them in traditional techniques and then they're out competing for jobs with somebody who has the same basic experiences, you know, they're not going to get that job. But if they have value-added skills, they, there, there could actually be a desirability to hiring a former inmate because we're gaining knowledge and experience that we otherwise don't have access to, you know. Um, and uh, so it just fits also. It would cost the government less. Our model would cost significantly less to implement and operate. Yeah. So the... Um the plants, that, the vegetables that you propose growing, is it a, a mix of all kinds, or would it be, I'm assuming it wouldn't be, still be corn? Yeah, so well, yeah. Like that, is, that is so hard on the, on the earth. We, we would certainly hope that they would put together, you know, a, a panel of experts in the different techniques and the different possibilities that we can produce. I, I, I don't care. Frankly, if they put it all into corn production, whatever. What we really care about is just to... Is, it's, it's counterproductive to involve animal agriculture and animal exploitation, period. What you do with the farmland, frankly, is up to you. But environmentally, sustainably, we can do so much. And, and we can produce vastly more food, protein, calories of the healthiest variety at a fraction of the cost, at a fraction of the water use and energy inputs. And we can do it in such a way that maintains the health of the soil and the land, and think about farming that pays attention to the health of the soil. How much more attention will we pay to the health of our prisoners, and the health of our community, and the health of the system? If we begin, and that's why I feel too that prison farms are an opportunity to change our society in Canada, beginning, quote, from the bottom up. And so the farms are a microcosm, and the prisons are a microcosm. And if we can begin there, then that could be the foundation for all the rest. And I would like for the prisoners to know that too, that they are the foundation of a better society. When you pass that institution, what do you feel? Conflicted. Very conflicted. In many ways, including in terms of my work with Evolve Our Prison Farms. Here I am talking about prisons and prisoners and what's best for prisons and prisoners. And I have nothing to do with what goes on behind those walls. I don't know their experiences. I haven't spoken to them personally. I'm talking on their behalf. So right there, I feel conflicted. I don't have the right. And yet, they don't have the right to be speaking for themselves. Well, they have the right, but no opportunity no platform for their voices. So, I don't like talking about them and what's best for them and what they would want. I don't like it, but I, I kind of have to, and I do feel it is in their best interests. Uh, but the idea, I'm a, I'm a daddy. I have a four-year-old son. And the idea of punishing somebody who makes bad choices by locking them up in a cage it doesn't work. That is, it is the crudest form of discipline. And if we ever did that to our children, we would be guilty of child abuse. And I'll tell you, if you locked up a child for a period of time and said, now I'm letting you out, 
and I expect you to be fixed. Let me tell you, the child that comes out of that lockup <laughs> is going to be worse. And, and that'll just continue because there's something very unnatural, very unloving, um, cruel, and, and thoughtless, mindless about it. That, that it's not, I don't believe it's a deterrent, I don't believe it's a cure, and I believe it's very unnatural. So when I think about raising a child, which is very, very hard to work, um, and how to discipline a child. Discipline means teaching. So somebody makes a bad choice, you teach, you instruct. And that's what discipline is. It's not a form of punishment. It's an opportunity to, to it's a rehabilitation. That's what it is. And so I don't believe in being tough on crime. I believe in dealing with human issues and understanding the underlying causes, where these things come out. And I'll tell you, with a four-year-old, you see things come out. You see human nature emerge, <laughs> you know, when expectations aren't met, when I didn't get what I wanted, when somebody treats me unfairly, when I want that and I can't have it and I want to just take it. All of human behavior you can see in a three-year-old and a four-year-old. And so how do we best guide and teach? And all of it, even discipline, comes from a place of love. And that's not how we treat our prisoners. That is not the function of our prisons. And so I do feel very conflicted about it. And frankly, I would be happy to see an end to the prison industrial complex. That's not to say that there if, say, what happened with the Russell Williams or the Paul Bernardos, or if somebody is a threat, there has to be a way to neutralize that threat until there can be a restoration to mental health. Uh, you know, uh, so I, 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 and I'm not the ones running the prison, so I am not here to say, if I ran the prisons, this is how it would be done, I would do it all differently. I'm not there, I don't know what it takes. And when you've got numbers like we've got, and we've got issues and social issues and poverty issues and all kinds of drug issues, you know, we don't have the best system yet. But I think we need to be having these conversations and asking these questions and asking, how can we do better in every way? I am out of questions, but that, I think that it could be a, a really great place to end, unless you yeah. have any other thoughts that you'd like to share for the historical record. For the historical <laughs> record? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. Oh, <laughs> I, I should maybe just tell this story just for fun, even though yeah. you don't have to include it if you don't want to include it. Um, but Because it's not Kingston specific. But That's I was trying right. to think about, like in my family or in my experiences, what prison kind of stories do we have? And my brother-in-law went to jail. Now, he went to jail because he was arrested because he hadn't returned his library book that he'd taken out when he was a kid. He never returned it. He lost it. He forgot all about it. And he was living in Montreal and just... He got, a, he got pulled over for speeding one day when he was an adult. And the cop takes his thing, goes back to the car, and comes back and says, there's a warrant out for your arrest. Because of this library book that you took out 15 or 20 years ago, whatever length of time it was, 15 years. And uh, they arrested him. <laughs> and the police officer was so apologetic. He said, I'm sorry, I have to do this. This is absolutely absurd. And he went to prison. He spent two weeks in a penitentiary. He didn't even go to a local jail straight to a penitentiary in Montreal or around Montreal and, uh, and spent two weeks in prison because of a library book. Nobody believes it, but it's true. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there are, you know, sometimes the system fails big time. Um, and also I don't, um, my, his father worked um, in the prison system in, near Montreal, and uh, that he was um, worked in the kitchens, and um, he ended up becoming um, an abusive alcoholic, and he ended up, I think, on uh, on disability leave because they accounted, at least you know, in large part, uh, um, that uh, his alcoholism had been connected to a lot of his experiences working within the prison system. So a lot of traumas, and it was very tough, rough job. So the impact that 
working in or around prisons, you know, it can have quite, quite an impact on individuals, on their families, and of course on society, you know. Um, so again, I, I, just, I just feel like we could do a whole lot better. Uh, protect our prisoners and protect our prison staff. And I think that the government is doing a good job so far, you know, and they do seem open, they do seem mindful of all of these things and they want to make it better. So I'm not sitting here criticizing what they're doing. Um, we're just on, on a trajectory that I hope continues to move in a positive direction. And progressive. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Calvin. This has been a wonderful interview, so interesting. Wonderful, good. I hope that, you know, future researchers find it just as interesting as I did. Thank you. Thank you. End of interview.